interesting. Thank you so much for um, coming out and joining us today. It is so nice to um, be able to introduce a two times Game Beards Award winning author of the Jemima Code and also Jubilee Cookbook, Tony Martin. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> he has been on the African Heritage and Health Advisory Board since 2011, which actually helped Pyramid of uh, created our African Heritage Diet Pyramid. And that further led on to our A Taste of African Heritage curriculum. So thank you so much, Tony, for joining today. And I'm happy I to be with you. Yes. Um, love, the, love the book pages. Can I just say the visuals on there were absolutely beautiful. And um, that's actually, we'll definitely get to that during our interview time. So thank you. And thank you for everyone for rejoining on. <laughs> Yeah, and, yeah. Thanks um, for your patience yeah. on this. Absolutely, I think Instagram's still fairly new, so <laughs> it's getting for greater error here um, too. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, absolutely, also, for sure. I'm still trying to donor. figure out the best way to uh, be positioned. Oh, hey, that's good. That's pretty okay. good. Yeah, can you? Yeah, that's pretty good. Like I just didn't want to have to keep trying to hold the phone. You're a little pixelated, but it's it's cool. We're good. Okay. Cool. Okay. Alrighty. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get started. Um, here at Always, we're so proud to have you as one of our advisory members of our African Heritage Program. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you first got connected with Old Ways. Yeah, it was. Um, well, first, I want to thank you for having me. Um, it's a joy to continue to promote um, the African Heritage Diet Pyramid. Um, I've been with you guys pretty much from the beginning. Um, I received a letter when I was living in Austin, Texas, uh, with an invitation from, I think, your, who your predecessor, Sarah, um, mm -hmm. another Sarah, <laughs> and um, she told me about this incredible program that was going to try to um, reclaim African heritage foods to promote health. And at the time, I was building a 501c3 nonprofit with the same focus. Um, at the, Michelle Obama had also um, invited a bunch of us to the White House to talk about um, improving the health of families uh, by getting through to the children. And so all of these things came together for me um, in this project that I had created. And so it was just a natural partnership. And um, to be completely transparent, I was really jealous uh, and wanted to be part of an organization that got to the words before I did. Um, I'm looking here, Sarah, her letter said, uh, to inspire better health through heritage. And I just loved that, that concept of, you know, um, that our foods are important and valuable. And I wanted to be part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the organization you're talking about is Sadie, right? The one in Austin with the children? Yes, yes, yes. Um, I, I have been, I've been a stay at home uh, a mom. I've kept my identity alive for years, but food and nutrition were passions for me from the start. Uh, because I grew up you know, with a vegetarian mother in Southern California, as most everybody knows by now. And um, I always felt like I, I couldn't fit in into the broader um, food society because our healthy eating habits didn't mesh well with the message of soul food. And I'm always very quick to point out that I don't mean any disparagement against what was accomplished um, through soul food. And through the food of, of the slave cabins, the creativity and industriousness there. But there's a whole other dimension to our food and, and the, the idea of tracing those aspects back to uh, pre-colonial Africa means everything you know, to me and, and the work that I do. Yeah, and I think you know, kicking off African Heritage um, Black History Month in celebration I would love to ask, because um, I know you grew up in the South, so from Texas, and I'm also from Houston, by the way. <laughs> um, 
you know, what is your relation to the African diaspora? And also, what is African heritage foods? Like, what does this term mean to you? Well, so I am from the Southern California, so I'm from the South. Um, um, but I did spend a great deal of time there. I raised my children in Austin, and my family is now in Houston. So we are, uh, I guess, adopted Texans. Um, but really, mm -hmm. my my um, heart and soul are still in Los Angeles. Um, I guess my connection, <laughs> I don't know how to go deeper than to say my relationship to the diaspora is I'm a descendant of enslaved Africans. Like, I'm not sure that you, if you're looking for something more than that, but, um, you know, that's my connection um, to our the food of our culture. And I have said that I grew up in a um, table that had a variety of food choices available, so not just the foods of the South, um, but we ate all kinds of other cultural foods. Um, and I think what's interesting is that we ate foods that would be considered African heritage foods, but we weren't identifying them necessarily that way. Um, the, I, I'm often, uh, I find, I'm fond of saying when I'm on tour that, um, you know, the list of the top 10 healthiest foods you can eat are foods that are, have African heritage associated with them. So dark leafy greens, we ate those. Lots of beans, we ate those. Um, yams and sweet potatoes, you know. So those are what we consider African heritage foods. And they've been embedded in American cuisine. Um, and until recently, and obviously through the pyramid, we have been identifying those foods more and more. Yeah, and I, I love your connection, how you were talking about, um, you know, growing up with those foods, but not actually realizing that they were African heritage foods, or, you know, like, just it being a regular thing around the table with family, like sweet potatoes, you can find that everywhere with the family. I'm always, we always have that in the kitchen. And it's really, you know, also it's heart, it's heart month, it's heart association month. So um, that, that's a really good ingredient. That's great for your heart. I think just um, being able to learn more about it um, is one way. I definitely think through old ways, but also through a lot of your research on um, recipes, ingredients, cuisines from um, different culinary experts in the field. And so that has been always helpful for me on my personal journey, but I think it goes hand in hand with bold ways and what we're focused on doing. Um, and also this week, I wanted to let you know that in Black History Month, Old Ways is doing our African Heritage Recipe Celebration. And so every Monday, we've been posting a recipe at the beginning of the week. And we ask our members to make one of those dishes and then um, post the hashtag. And um, this week, we decided to do the peanuts do and it's based upon your peanut soup in Jubilee and I just loved the chapter where you were talking about the soups and salads and um, I guess and if you're looking for the recipe for the audience um, for the peanut soup in Jubilee it's on page one definitely check it out um, oh that's so cool because I, I would have had to go look in the index <laughs> You know, page 139 for the audience if you want to look for it. Um, I must ask, what was the significance of featuring the peanut soup in your book? And also, you know, could you explain a little bit of its importance to African heritage cuisine? Yeah, good question. So um, when I conceived of the book Jubilee, I knew that I was going to be breaking ground with classic recipes that many people would feel like have no cultural um, distinction, meaning, you know, Southern and soul food can look very much alike, um, except for the way that they're seasoned, right? That, as Leah Chase once said, ours just tastes better. <laughs> and um, so when I was trying to assemble uh, and organize my thoughts around how to write a book that I wasn't claiming was the total canon of African-American cooking, what highlights should I use 
to draw people into the food of our culture. And so in the introduction, I explained that I've used, created a formula um, that included four or five, I forget now, variables that each recipe would reflect in one way or another. And so that would mean that the dish either um, existed early on in our food history as far back as the plantation south, um, it perhaps was something that persisted through migration so that no matter where we went as part of the mi great migration, that dish, it continued to stay with us, even though we might have made local changes according to um, the things that we found in that natural and grind in environment or in the grocery stores or whatever. I um, mean, another one of those categories was its African, was a dish's African lineage. Um, it was really important to me using um, the words of scholars, including uh, Dr. Harris, to say what are some classic techniques that persist in African cooking once um, our ancestors arrive here um, in the States through the Middle Passage. And peanuts, obviously, are an important um, ingredient. Um, they're an important crop in West Africa. And I wanted to ensure that we could the evolution of a dish from, from Africa and, and see how it shows up in American culture. So the peanut stew was a really great way to do that um, because you can see um, the use of nuts as a thickener uh, and mm -hmm. to give soups and stews body um, in the continent and then you get here and a lot of the chunkiness or the part that makes it a stew the volume right that we would have wanted for good health and to keep us full and to create fiber and all of those healthy variables those are removed in the plantation south because they go onto the menu as the food of the elite so it's very refined it's rich in cream maybe it's made with a roux um, the, you know, the peanuts are pureed and almost disappear into this luxurious chicken broth and cream mix, cream based mixture. So I wanted to really show the way that our food um, evolved, um, but we still managed to keep our fingers on, um, you know, on our, our history. And that's a great dish to, to show that transfer. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Like I loved when I was reading this section of the chapter and it was saying how sometimes when people had guests or whatnot, they would stream out, you know, everything from the stew and just serve the broth because that was kind of a more formal thing. And to me, when I was reading, I was like, what? Like I would want all the vegetables and I would want all the healthy ingredients, but that was proper, you know, during right. those times. So really interesting to learn more about that. Well, and what's really been fun for me, uh, at least until COVID, was I ch intentionally uh, chose African-American restaurants to hold my book tour uh, in. <laughs> and many of the chefs chose that recipe as the um, appetizer course. Mm -hmm. And it was always presented in really lovely ways, um, in little demi-tasse cups or in shot glasses. Um, but everybody got the message, right, that you can, if you want to go full on um, culturally, you can um, serve it as a stew, but you can also adapt it to um, being an, a nice, delicate first course. And I think especially in, in um, audiences where people aren't really clear what a peanut soup even tastes like, there's an enormous amount of surprise that happens, right, when they sip this delicate soup. Um, there's just a lot that happens on your palate that that um, is surprising and wonderful. Yeah, and it's it's always popular too. Like I think even when Old Ways mentions the moth they stew and they people see the peanut ingredients, they're like, what are you sure? And it's like, oh, it's delicious. Try it. <laughs> right, right. And we had that question, right, when we were finalizing the recipes, do we put mafe in the stews? Do we have the lamb as a separate, you know, how do we represent that? So there's a cross-reference between, I think, the, 
the two versions um, because the lamb mafe stands by itself in the meat section, um, but it's an, a version of this dish as well. So, you know, there's a lot of really fascinating and um, delicious food that is um, inherent in our culture and in African food ways. Um, and I think the program, one of the reasons I speak about it at every presentation I give um, is because it, it, the program is instilling a sense of pride in, the, in our food um, mm -hmm. and making that connection back to diasporan cooking in a very healthy way. Um, years and years ago when I was food editor at the Plain Dealer, they invited me to come on the morning show during February and they wanted me to talk about soul food. And then the producer said, and what we want you to do is um, tell people, you know, the, all the cautions for why they shouldn't eat it and offer substitutions. And I was like, no, I think you have the wrong person. Yeah, I think I, I just declined <laughs> and said, I think if that's your focus, you have the wrong um, speaker because what I might be more inclined to do is talk to people about consuming less packaged, produced, manufactured, and fast food. That's really where our um, problems, our health problems emerge. And so I was speaking and preaching this gospel before, um, before the pyramid was created, but I didn't really have a forum, um, you know, where I could really promote the message as much as I can now. And so um, I'm not doing a lot of um, Zooming because I'm, or, you know, IG living um, because mm -hmm. my schedule is so full right now with Cook's Country. Um, but this was an important message for me to make the connection um, to old ways and the work of Jubilee and the Jemima Code because it's what I've always done on the road anyway. Absolutely. And I love that you mentioned Cook's Country. Speaking of that, I have Oh, the look at you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, how far beautiful. away are you guys from the office? Um, we are, how far am I from the office? Are you in Boston? Yeah, I'm in Boston. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Okay. I guess you go in though and you want to pick them up anyway. Wait. Yeah. 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 This is beautiful. I felt so special going to the store to get my issue of Cook Country. One, uh, congratulations. I love that you're Thanks. the new editor in chief. Um, this, I went through all of the recipes and <laughs> I can't wait to try. I think there was the sweet potato fritters or whatnot. There was one that involved the sweet potatoes and I was like, oh, I'm going to add this to my list. So I have to try very soon this month <laughs> and so yeah um, i'm really happy I'm... you were able to find one um because they're they're appearing less and less on newsstands um just as you know um if you notice it's a larger size format than mm -hmm. traditional magazines yeah. which makes it harder for them to slot so anybody that is having <laughs> trouble um finding them uh check in with our customer service um, department and you know figure out how you can get a subscription or don't write me but <laughs> um, <laughs> be persistent because they're not everywhere like when I was interviewing I, I had trouble finding them just because the, the oversize it makes for a spectacular magazine and um, because we can get so much more content on the page mm -hmm. um, but but it does present some other limitations for us yeah, I really cool. Um, there's like a magazine bookstore right nearby. And so I was like, I'm going to support locally, you know, during the pandemic, especially these small owned businesses. So I called in and asked and they were like, yes, we have the new issue. And I was like, I'm coming right away. <laughs> Hold oh, it to awesome. the side well, and you know, there are also, um, we are really moving um, in, in large measure towards um, digital. Um, so there's going to be all kinds of new, exciting um, stories and um, recipes, but for now you can um, subscribe electronically and that gives you access not only to Cook's Country, but also to our other brands um, within the ATA America's Test Kitchen um, brand, um, which would be Cook's Illustrated 
and America's Test Kitchen. So visit the website of either one of the three and they will all come up. And uh, then you can learn more about how to get your very own copy. Yes, I think someone had asked if they're available locally or just in Boston, I mean, nationally or in Boston, and they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, they are sure. everywhere. But as I, I did want to caution everyone that they are, they can be hard to find because of their um, oversized cut, which I just like the Jemima code. When we talked about making a spectacular coffee table book, we knew we wanted something beautiful. And um, that's also part of the allure for me of, of Cook's Country Magazine is it is really... Um, beautiful. The photography is spectacular. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the first changes you will see um, in my full on issue, um, which this I am on the masthead here because I, you know, of course, the publication corresponded with my hiring, but um, it's not really my I didn't have great hands on here yet. And um, but in the mm -hmm. first issue where I did, which is the April May issue, um, we've made a significant change that I'm really, really proud of. Um, and everyone knows that um, people behind recipes are what is the most important thing for me. Um, I'm interested mm -hmm. in storytelling, talking about who created the dish before you did. And um, mm -hmm. so we have an archive of some spectacular portraiture. And so we're going to start um, highlighting a different American cook on one of the pages on the back page of the magazine. So when people clue in, so if you look on that back page right now, you have an issue, right? On the back right now, there's um, right. Mm -hmm. all the way, no, the inside back. Like, so the inside okay. last cover, there's a gorgeous dessert there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yes. Yep. So it's still like candied mouth. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, the next one, past that, the absolute last, like, it's the, the oh, margarita it dish, the margarita glass. Oh, the margarita, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 so if you look at that, that's a really pretty portrait of, of Moose. Well, um, mm -hmm. Moose is lovely, but we are now going to be talking about a important American cook there. And oh. I'm so, so excited, so, so excited about that, because when I first created the Jemima code, it was all about the pictures of the people. And mm -hmm. so that's just one way that I am going to spotlight American cooks of all cultures, mm -hmm. whether you are Hungarian American, African American, German American, everyone will have a turn to be there. I'm really excited about it. That is so great. That was actually my one of my questions that was shaping the legacy of Cook's Country. Um, I'm curious, do you foresee any future projects with the um, African Heritage Dive in regards of Cook's Country or any sort of connection? <laughs> well, I am thinking about it. I can assure you of that. Um, one way I can tell you um, that it doesn't require us to create a big project um, will be to just integrate more foods from the diaspora onto our pages. Um, it's an easy thing for us to do. Um, I say easy, meaning it's easy for us to, to trace recipes and, and place them um, on the page. It's another thing to present recipes that are accurate. So I have some concern about um, the introduction of a lot of um, cultural foods that people are not familiar with, right? There's this interesting, there's a tiny, there's a tension between what's familiar and, you know, the idea that you want to give people something new, but then the questions of whether it's authentic or not are um, plaguing mainstream media because we have to make sure that our recipes appeal to the broadest audience, meaning can those people find those ingredients in their hometown, right? There's are some simple mm -hmm. issues that we face with a national publication that you don't face if you're writing um, to your unique audience on a blog where people are willing to, you know, hunt down ingredients and whatever. Um, so we're, we're contemplating that. Um, it's important to me and everyone who knows me knows that it won't change just because I went to a mainstream magazine. Um, but it does require me to think strategically 
about how we can provide room for various disparate voices so that if your peanut stew is different than mine and I run your recipe, I don't want all of my followers writing and complaining that that's not really the way you do it. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, and we're, and we're a vocal, we're a vocal group now. Um, food, foodies, um, rightly so are, are defending the food cult of cultures and, uh, holding all of us at mainstream publications accountable. And I want to be really careful and conscientious and sensitive to those concerns. Um, but not to the exclusion of not including any recipes at all, just to be safe. Right. So, so initially I'll be um, hiring freelance. Mm -hmm. I will be looking to subject matter experts that I trust. Um, they will mostly be pals of mine that everybody knows um, because we, we um, trust their authority. Uh, but over time, as with that back page photo, um, I want to get more um, involved with people on the local level and just hear more about how your neighbor makes the peanut stew. And hopefully by that time, the audience will trust me and trust the magazine and know that we're providing diverse voices. We're not whitewashing your recipe because that's not something that I'm willing to do. I'm so excited for the new issue. I'm, I'm excited. I feel like there's so much to look forward to. This is, yeah, I'm really excited. I, I yeah. imagine it being a lot more inclusive for people. So um, it's going to evolve. So I don't know that you, I don't, I don't know how much um, you'll notice at first. We have a cumin scented chicken um, that emerged, mm -hmm. appears um, over the next couple of months. Um, we have um, got a recipe on oxtail coming up. Um, and so, but those will run right alongside chicken tostadas that are easy and quick that you can mm -hmm. make overnight, you know, for a weeknight. Um, so, so we want to make sure that cultural cooking feels just as comfortable and familiar as whatever we consider to be um, mm -hmm. the mundane American uh, standard American diet food, right? Um, so that the idea of making a peanut stew feels just as natural and tastes just as delicious and is just as foolproof um, as any other recipe that we have on our pages. Yeah. And I must ask, because since you're in the magazine publishing world, you probably have to be ahead, you know, when you're working on something, a projects like this, you really have to think about, you know, already fall issue or, you know, working. So I'm curious if there are any um, African heritage um, trends like spices, dishes or ingredients that you predict will be trending soon that we should look into. <laughs> well, I think you're right to recognize that the foods uh, of Africa, of India, of Asia, those are all foods that are now appearing in mainstream media in with their original titles, right? They're not even, we aren't even changing the names. Um, we're expecting the readers to do a little work, right? And that's a good thing. It's a good thing. We're learning about other cultures and, and the ways that um, they get dinner on the table. And um, so those spices are definitely, I think, going to continue to show up more and more. They're definitely appearing more in the recipes we're thinking about. Um, Plant-based is another, I think, um, area of alignment for the African Heritage Diet Pyramid and mainstream media. We are um, definitely um, going to be turning our lens more towards plant-based recipes. We had a meeting yesterday where we were talking about beef stroganoff, chicken stroganoff, fricassee, mm -hmm. what are the distinctions between all of those? And I thought, well, is there a mushroom one? And how can we make this dish a suitable for vegetarians um, since that's my orientation? So, so we're gonna be looking at 
plant-based for sure and definitely um, bold spices and seasonings um, that, you know, maybe there is a subtle presence of them at first and maybe there'll be a full-on dish like our cumin scented chicken that is um, mm. um, really um, delicious and creamy and, um, you know, it, it, um, it's going to appear at a time of year when people some people may not be thinking about stew, but in its natural um, orientation in India, you would eat a hot stew any time of year. You would do that in Africa any time of year, and so mm -hmm. so we are we are paying attention to those nuances. When do we publish a recipe? How much education can we really do? Um, a lot uh, if people are willing mm -hmm. to be patient with us as we work through um, educating everybody. Yes, um, I just want to do a check-in. Can you see me fine? Because I know it's getting a little pixeled on your side. I can one still part see where... you. Okay, and volume and everything is good. Are you connected? I'm going to um... check headset. Oh, we have the same oh, earbud. <laughs> can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Perfect. Just making sure. And I think, yeah, my that was a good. Is still pretty good. That's good. That's you're huh. like the 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 person on the the trail when we're out that has the water just at the right moment. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. I, yes, okay. I can hear you pretty. And audience tuned in to thank you. Perfect. So um, I guess we're, I'm moving on to another question. Um, this is okay. one that um, I wanted to like a topic. Um, so let me just word it by word before I mulk it up. <laughs> but um, being that your goal is achieved, being that your goal, which has already been achieved, is focused on inspiring and energizing the next generation of Black talented youth in the food industry. I would love to know what ways are you continuing to reach the younger audience and what advice do you, can you provide for them? You know, amazing cookbook authors, chefs, speakers like yourself. Hmm. Well, um, there's a couple of answers uh, in that question. I'm going to continue to do what I have always done. Um, from day one, um, which is invite those that are interested and willing and learning to come along. Um, I'm hoping to have opportunities for interns at Intrual, um, meaning culinary writing, test cooking. You know, we're, we're evaluating um, the team right now. Um, I'd love to be able to um, hire a seasoned writer at some point. Um, who can help manage um, this dexterity that's required for for really doing deep dives and researching culturally appropriate, um, culturally sensitive recipes. Um, but I love, um, I also love the idea of thinking about uh, magazine leadership, right? I mean, Don and I were hired on the same day um, and so we were both standing in this peculiar space of being the first. Um, I've mm -hmm. been the first editorially where. Um, and so I would love to be grooming more people to follow in this editorial line. Um, I think as you and others may know, um, I spent a year um, researching and recruiting Jarrell um, to be the photographer for Jubilee. And she is certainly an important aspect of its success, right? Her photos are spectacularly beautiful. Um, and, and I know that it seems, I'm sure that because of social media and opportunity and Instagram and everybody has all their followers, it seems like, oh, you know, what she's saying is old news, right? People have opportunity everywhere. I don't think so. Um, I was in, as I'm preparing these posts every day from, from the Jemima code, uh, if everybody doesn't know, I've been posting for black history month, a different book, uh, African-American cookbook on my Instagram to 
just remind us of who our ancestors have been um, as a source of pride in our legacy. And um, so I was tracing back and looked back at the Jemima Code when I originally conceived of it. And the word choices that I was making in 2010, just in that 10 year period of trying to claim a space that right now everybody's claimed, right? Everybody's got their own way, their own voice, their own adaptations of dishes, their own interpretations, they're dancing and singing about it on TikTok. Like it's, it's really <laughs> happening and hip and easy and fun and funky and all of that. But in 2010, <laughs> I couldn't get published, right? So I had to take my project to social media, to the internet and say, I'm going to do this for a year. And if anybody likes it, maybe I'll get a book deal. And it's easy, easy, easy to forget that when you see two Black women appointed on the same day. It just seems like, oh, okay, well, media's growing up. Um, we, we need a lot more food stylists and restaurant designers and um, researchers and scholars. And there's just so many opportunities for us that don't necessarily require uh, brick and mortar restaurants. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Jemima Code project um, matters because it represents, uh, it, it provides the representation we haven't seen. We haven't seen role models for Black people in the culinary arts across the board. And, and so um, I, in the long answer to your question is, in whatever ways I can touch and provide an opportunity, I plan to do that, whether that is hiring. Um, so everybody should at least bombard me for now. Um, illustrators, right? The, the second page of the magazine or the opening page, if you want to show them has, um, it will have, I don't think that one has it, um, has a letter from the editor. Yes, and I was looking that letter, for that. Yes. Yeah, so that, that's the evidence that I'm not quite there yet. I'm transitioning. Uh -huh. I made it to the yeah, mountain, yeah, but my I letter's not there. I see you mentioned, I'm <laughs> like, right. I, was, I was going to the, like, where is that? <laughs> So I'm that's glad so it's, cool. It's so, but for that page, for that page accompanying my letter, there will be a so we'll be looking to, uh, you know, maybe have some freelance illustrators. Um, we're contemplating how to handle photography. Um, I think what I want to convey to everyone is it's not that it's so complicated to figure out how to hire. It's that I've, part, I've joined a brand that everything was done in-house. So we have a, a lovely stable of terrific photographers and food stylists. El Simone, for example, is there. Um, test kitchen cooks and directors, and right? So we have everything that we need. Um, but we wanna do more. We want to um, use the ATK space and laboratory and platform as a way to help educate the next generation. So as soon as we can get back into the office, we'll be thinking about ways to do that. And my yeah, tip absolutely. is, <laughs> my, my tip is that um, in, in the spirit of adaptation, appropriation, appreciation, um, I leave everybody with the same words that I have in Jubilee, which is that, um, we should all be free to adapt recipes to our own tastes and preferences. What we shouldn't do, well, if you, so for example, if your kids don't like onions, you should feel free to remove the onions and it can still be an authentic, true representation of a dish. What we can't do is disrespect and not honor the origin story that's associated with the recipe. And I think that's how several entities have been getting themselves into trouble recently right um so our goal is going to be respect and people first um we know our stuff when it comes to recipe development it's in our dna at atk um we have that down um pat but what i want us to do is really be thoughtful now not i don't want to terrorize my team like i don't want them thinking oh my god we can never run a taco recipe again um, because we'll be accused of not understanding the difference between the way it's served in Mexico and the way it's served somewhere else. Uh, I don't I don't want us to do that. And I don't want us to do that at home. I don't want us to do that to each other. 
I believe in using food as a unifier. And the way that we do that is to be respectful um, and um, find our common ground in the way that we, you know, make a dish. Maybe you both, maybe we stand side by side one another and make a dish, you know, or make it at home and then swap like when we're able to do that again. Wouldn't that be a fun project? Like we could have somebody make yeah, something from the, heritage, the African Heritage Diet Pyramid, make a dish, <laughs> swap it with your neighbor, and then they can see how it tasted when they make it and what ad adaptations they made, and then you could come together and talk about it. That'd be yeah, fun. that would be a great way to, you know, collaborate. I think especially during a time of isolation, like that's, that's a really beautiful idea. Like I could even see there being like a club that does that. <laughs> So yeah, that's well, really I have a to share idea. You, it's not part of I don't think it's part of the questions that we were we talked about, but um as <laughs> part of my partnership and being an advisor to um the council that created the pyramid, um I was there when the Walmart funding be came through so that we could mm -hmm. transition from um a a program to an actual six week cooking class. And so I ran those cooking classes in a tiny little library at the public library in Austin, Texas. And the great story related to what we're talking about in terms of an adaptation and taste buds and developing our appreciation um, was that we were in this little caterer's kitchen and you know, like literally they were sitting next to the wolf range. And you know, professionally a wolf range throws off a lot of heat and they were concentrated in this space. And there was a woman who um, always sat in the back. And when I was talking about the lesson plan um, on greens, and there's no meat in the greens, right? They're just seasoned with lots of yeah. onion and garlic, yeah. and they are <laughs> delicious. But I could see this woman making a face at me from the back of the room. And when you speak to audiences, the that you, you can see when mm -hmm. people are checking out and she was giving me that mm -hmm, this sister don't know what she's right I got was I was definitely getting her vibe. <laughs> mm -hmm. and um so at the end of the class um they taste the dish as part of their curriculum exercise because I'm you're demonstrating I don't know if you guys have changed that but back then the cook the teacher We're cooked both yeah still do mm -hmm. that yeah and so so I cooked yeah, it did. and then they tasted and from that week on, the next week forward, she sat in the front of the class next to that hot range. She mm -hmm. would, sweat would be dripping down <laughs> her face, but she wanted Indeed. to be right up front. She wanted, and it was so amazing. And at the end of the six weeks, I was cleaning up, you know, and wrapping up everything. And the odd, the group were they were a diverse group because we promoted it through the local newspaper. So it wasn't just African Americans as this pilot class. And they didn't want to stop talking. They didn't want to stop eating. They didn't want to stop sharing. Um, it was amazing to see in that little setting the power of learning about the food of another culture. And um, it is that story and the health profile of our food that. Um, has mattered to me so much and why I continue to talk about what Old Ways is doing. Any um, video of me anywhere <laughs> likely ends with Old Ways. And we do a lot of shout outs for you also, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I, I named up quite a lot and sorry if you see me reposting, <laughs> but we, we love that you are a part of our community. Honestly, all of our advisory members that I've talked with have been such amazing people. And so being able to connect with you has honestly just been a joy of its own. But I love that you were talking about, um, you know, working uh, first impressions when it comes to the class, because I think a lot of people forget that it's 100% plant based, there's no meat, there's no dairy. You know, the impression of you know someone seeing you cook the it was probably the zesty collard greens is what I'm thinking the recipe that you're talking yeah, about yeah but she mm -hmm, probably saw right. it with no meat and she was like oh this is gonna be gross she took one bite and she said 
I'll have a plate. <laughs> right. And of course, you're only making these little sample servings. So there wasn't a lot. Um, you know, that reminds me, do we have we have a couple of minutes. So another really fun story connected to the pyramid and that development period. Um, Sarah and I went to the Essence Festival. And mm -hmm. we were um, put in a booth in the community organizations, like right between the people that are taking your blood pressure <laughs> and trying mm -hmm. to sell you the vibrating chair thing for your feet. <laughs> And um, but, and so we were basically lost at the festival, right? We weren't out on that trade floor where all of the hairstylist stuff and the vendors and the, the sororities, you know, none of that. Here we are over, you know, like shoved into this little corner. So we took one of the banners. Um, this is how I thread all of my work together. We took one of the banners mm -hmm. from the women of the Jemima Code uh, a woman named Betty Simmons, who was a hundred year old, formerly enslaved woman. And I've got a portrait of her taken directly out of the Library of Congress that we blew up into a big eight foot banner. And we posted it right outside of our um, little booth. And we had on the table little dishes with the, the aromatic African Afro, Afrocentric seasonings in them. So there was a dish with cumin and pepper and chili powder and, you know, all of the um, mm -hmm. cardamom, various things like that. And um, we were using those as a way to lure the children over to the table, right? So they, we had played a game, you could come over and smell the smell them and ask your parents if they would cook something for you with those seasonings. Mm -hmm. And um, women were coming by saying they had to come over and see what auntie or granny or mama, you know, this, but this picture, what was she selling? She was the draw sure. that got people to come over and see our tent, our, um, our booth. Mm -hmm. And once we got them, they were hooked. They were like, well, we have generations of people that have sugar, meaning, you know, diabetes. And we just assumed that that was a, the way we just were going to die. Like we, we don't have any choice. We don't have, it's just an inheritance, right? We're just stuck with it. And that was really heartbreaking to me yeah. then. And it is now in the time of COVID thing that, um, um, that we really need our health now more than ever. And um, so luring people in with pictures of a healthy grandmother, uh, getting them to sample seasonings, get them to taste the greens without the meat, all of that, but try to get more African uh, heritage foods in your diet is the message I like to promote. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that flashback. And I actually saw a picture of you, um, I think it was you and Sarah at a booth. And I actually, I saw that, um, it was like an old post I was going through in our archive and I was like, oh, what's, what's oh, this here? Right. And I was like, all the essence. I saw the essence in the background. I was like, "Oh, we were at essence. Okay, what what year was this?" <laughs> and there were people yeah, um, drawn to you guys. But that was that was a beautiful banner, though. Did you what did what did you do with the banners? Did you are they all in a museum now, or you know what? Um, no, I still have them. The ones I have them with me there. Huh? Yeah, I have them all. Um, you know, they were they were my way at the time of promoting people again, people first. Um, now I have so many other platforms. Um, I used to call them the ladies and a few gentlemen. Um, mm -hmm. And everybody at that time got to know, you know, they were asking me, where are you and the ladies going next? And, and we might <laughs> be in museums, we might be at a place like Essence Festival, um, but they don't get out very much anymore. Um, they've, they've been replaced on the page by books. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you just side note do you happen to have one of melinda russell or um no? we don't nobody we haven't seen melinda russell we still don't know um any more about her than has been written um i was really pleased to see somebody post because i wasn't aware that her book was now available online because i have the last copies of them of of her book mm -hmm. um michigan sent them to me for my collection and um um, they're facsimiles, of course. But um, yeah, we haven't seen her or Abby Fisher. There are no paintings, nothing so far that, we've, that has been discovered. But that is, again, one of those 
next generation scholar, student scholar jobs um, that's waiting right there for somebody to just research her life. She left us some yeah. great clues. Amazing woman. I mean, when so I was did reading Abby up Fisher. on Twitter, mm -hmm. Yeah, they both um, left behind writings, which was, that's, yeah, I think, Tony, when it comes to your um, books and just your articles that you've published, it's like such a learning lesson with each of them. And it's like going back into history and the fact that you beautifully illustrate the connection, you know, between who you know, created this recipe or who is the first one to cook it or use it. Um, I just really love all the stories. Like I know you've talked about Melinda Russell a few times. And so um, when I was uh, checking out books and I saw the mentions, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> it was really nice. I think if it was, what, what was it? When she opened her pastry shop, it was um, 18 or 1860. If I could go back to that time. She published a book in 1866. 1866? But her, yeah. her, when was her store? Was it in the, was it in the 50s? Or, um, cause she I don't, had, I don't um, know. I, we don't, I, I don't know. Um, that part much hasn't been told. There are other pastry shop owners that I have, that we may have conflated, you know, their memory um, as they represent one another um, because um, Savannah in particular was a hotbed for pastry shop owners and confectionery store, you know, shopkeeper. So, um, but we don't know yet um, anything more than the fact that she owned a bakery. I don't, I don't know. Maybe others do. Well, to be disclosed, let's see, learn more. <laughs> I would love to do more yeah. research on her. Um, when that have is um well there's just a few tiny questions that I just want to end off with but um are there any um favorite cookbooks you've been reading or looking into during your free time well, and free time, um, that's an interesting thing <laughs> don't have any I bet that. that's impossible <laughs> for you <laughs> yeah it's impossible right now I um I am on before I accepted this role, I was supposed to be completing a memoir. And anyone who's ever gone through just the exercise of journaling can understand that that can be a really tumultuous thing to do, especially being the first, as I have been, of everything in the food world. Um, I've got some scars and, and some painful memories. And I just reached a place where I was peeling those scabs off and starting to write about it. And then this opportunity became available. So I'm not writing much. Um, I'm also under contract to write um, a, uh, to continue the Jubilee messaging through a Jubilee book series. So a multi-part series. And the first book will be on cocktails. Um, I am waiting to make an announcement about a partnership there to um, uplift generation and, and um, uh, just get get some. Uh, I'm thinking about the words here. I'm really being careful. I'm I'm going to be producing a book on cocktails, and I'm going to be um, partnering um, with a friend, and we'll talk about that more when we're able to do that. Um, uh, so I, yeah, I'm not reading too many cookbooks and I know there are terrific ones out there. I feel really terrible that so many of my friends have finally reached that opportunity and I haven't been able to blurb for them. Um, but like literally when I turn off this computer in the evening, <laughs> I'm, I'm done. done. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. 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 yeah I want to, I want to watch, I don't quite want to watch cartoons yet, but. <laughs> Something clear off your mind, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something else. Not food related right now. But there's some terrific ones out there. I mean, there are some great ones that I'm eager to read. I cannot wait to read Mashama's book. Um, I just, I'm really, I'm looking across at the table of what's there. I'm really excited about that. Um, it was um, great to be part of the rise, and I'm really proud of that. Um, and, um, you know, Bryant's book, mm -hmm. Vegetable Kingdom. Um, and then there's just so many more that are, oh, look, go girl. 
<laughs> yeah, so I, I can shout them out. I know they're there. They're over there, but I have, um, I'm reading a lot of Cook's Country right now. Yeah. Thank you for sharing about the projects that you'll be working on and so excited to tune in. I'm, you know, a follower, of course, so <laughs> we will be tuning in. Um, yeah. One last thing I want to ask, and this is honestly for the audience, but it was just, um, can you share a cooking or nutrition tip that um, people can incorporate in their day-to-day -day life? Like, um, I don't know, for instance, uh, eating, you know, half a handful of peanuts every day or, you know, some sort of tip or advice. <laughs> Um, something I'm doing lately is um, having a cup of soup before mealtime. Um, mm -hmm. In the pandemic isolation, um, we're all sitting a lot. I cannot exercise yet because of my um, hospitalization and injury in the fall. And so the sedentary lifestyle is just wreaking havoc. And um, I diet, but I find myself snacking all the time, right? Mm -hmm. you're, the kitchen's always there now. If you're at home, you had to go to yeah. the vending machine at the office, right? And you had to pay. But now you just open the cabinet and the junk food is staring at you. So um, <laughs> having that cup of soup, um, there is, some, my, I grew, you know, the, the, the philosophy that you drank, uh, if you drank water, you would fill up, right? So my mother didn't want us to drink anything because mm -hmm. we wouldn't eat our dinner. Um, and then I became involved in the food in the nutrition industry. And they used to tell you to drink a glass of water before you ate because then you would fill up, right? And you wouldn't mm -hmm. eat, consume <laughs> less food. Um, but over time, studies have shown that um, a warm cup of soup uh, broth is even more effective than having a glass of water. Um, so that's something I'm trying to um, for uh, curbing my appetite and making sure that I really focus on eating healthy food because I tend to eat healthy anyway. I'm a, a whole meal salad girl. We eat a lot of grilled vegetables and fish and poultry. So I don't have to work that hard to have a have healthier menus, but I'm a snacker. Mm -hmm. I love, love, love sweets. <laughs> and so, so I, sh I calculate my calories so that I can have the thing I really want. And so soup oh, is a <laughs> soup is a terrific way to for to curb your appetite and get some additional nutrients depending on like if you make a great bone broth, something like that. Oh my gosh, that's, that's what so I do. Great. That's, yeah, that's brilliant. That's funny. I've got lentil stew on the stove right now. <laughs> I've been trying a lot of soups lately, but I've noticed that's something they do. Um, when I was abroad in Spain, they would do a lot of soups. The uh, the wives would make soup a lot to curb the appetite. It. Yeah. yeah, and they were delicious too. So <laughs> right, right, and we have that broth making tradition as part of our culture. Right, when mm -hmm. our grandmother said, "I'm going to put on a pot of beans," she was making broth. That's the origin of the recipe in Jubilee for smoky ham hock stock. Right, was because they were putting on, you know, they were making a broth. Um, we can make vegetable broth um, by just cooking up a bunch of vegetables, and you can skim them off if you want, or eat them you know, leave them there for the roughage. But yeah, soup is terrific. And it's part of our who we are. Absolutely. The welcoming, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <More> welcoming. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for joining today. It has been an absolute slice of heaven being, being able to meet with, with both author Tony Tipton Martin, an African heritage and health advisory member from Old Ways. Um, for all you guys who've tuned in, um, thank you for showing your support. Um, Tony, was there anything you would say? No, I just want to say that I'm, I miss seeing all of you guys out on the road. Um, that's been the hardest part for me. Um, and then, you know, the Zoom demand is, is hard. So just know <laughs> I'm not around a lot, um, but I'm thinking about you guys and and thinking of ways, strategizing ways to make sure that our presence is known, even if you don't see me with you all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. I love and you feel guys feel free all. to tune in to, <laughs> feel free to tune in to Tony's Instagram page and also A Taste of Heritage. Um, 
we'll be sharing a lot of things during Black History Month and celebration. And um, yeah, and there will be, I will be, I will have a segment on Cook's Country TV next fall. So we can also look forward to that. So yeah. we'll be around. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, great. Thank Thanks you so everyone. much for having me. Um, Thanks absolutely. for tuning in, everybody. Thank you. And I'm the curriculum coordinator from Old Ways. If you guys have any questions um, about the nonprofit, please feel free to connect. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you again. <laughs>